saying with his, hey, hey, let's let's get the most fanatical global warming believers in the world to come to our country. Let's uh, throw a UN conference on global warming and we'll get politicians and activists and UN officials and bureaucrats and all those finger waggers in one room, 72,000 of them, and then we'll hit them with the truth bomb. You hypocrites, you know. Oil and gas are God's gift to humanity. Well, that's exactly what... It sounds preposterous, but that's exactly what happened in Baku last night, the capital of Azerbaijan, which is hosting this latest UN conference of climate change. Our interview Minister Chris Bowen, but you know, it's going to go there in a few days. Please stop him. Don't take our money. Um, there's no doubt all these warmers would have gone there expecting to get what they got in the warm-up act yesterday. You know, the president of this global warming mass worship, uh, preaching doom and gloom. Colleagues, we are on the road to ruin. But these are not the future problems. Climate change is already here. From flooded homes in Spain to forest fires in Australia, from rising oceans in the Pacific to barren plains in East Africa. Whether you see them or not, people are suffering in the shadows. They are dying in the dark. And they need more than compassion. Yeah. Could someone tell that goose that we haven't had serious fires in Australia for nearly five years now? I mean, what is he talking about? But that's what these meetings are always for, right? Trying to terrify the world into obeying whatever they think of next, eating insects instead of meat, uh, getting rid of your petrol cars, handing over your wallet, of course. But then came the president of Azerbaijan, the host country. Brilliant. First, praising what their delegates had actually come to attack, oil and gas. I understand that this topic is not very popular at climate change conference, but without that, my comments would not be complete. It's a gift of the God. Every natural resource, whether it's oil, gas, wind, sun, gold, silver, copper, all that are natural resources. And countries should not be blamed for having them and should not be blamed for bringing these resources to the market because the market needs them. The people need them. And this country exports a lot of gas, but what really got his goat is that Europe has been begging for even more of it. While European politicians meanwhile say, oh, how terrible gas, global warming. Well, this president really went to town on them. While well, the UN Secretary General, one of the worst alarmists, had to just sit and listen and eat that sandwich. Eight out of ten countries which uh, have access to Azerbaijani gas are Europeans. And European Commission also asked us to double gas supply to Europe by 2027. Unfortunately, double standards a habit to lecture other countries and political hypocrisy became kind of modus operandi for some politicians, state control NGOs and fake news media in some Western countries. Yeah, at some people there liked it, uh, but you know, it says to me that this whole global warming scare is running out of puff. And by the way, 72,000 people Global warming warriors went to Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan 72,000. What about their emissions? Couldn't they do this over the internet on Teams or something? They're talking to me Daniel Wilde, Deputy Executive Director of the Institute of Public Affairs, and Garth Hamilton, a Federal Liberal MP from Queensland. Uh, Daniel Wilde, how good was that little dose of reality? It was very enjoyable, Andrew, and uh, look, the President of Azerbaijan makes an important point, which is that nations are demanding fossil fuels, and developing nations need fossil fuels in order to grow their economies and to get out of poverty. Uh, so I think it's a valuable insight that he's offered. Uh, and I think the other point, Andrew, is it's another example of how net zero is dead. Uh, you make the point about the global warming scare is now running out of, uh, running out of gas, uh, to use an analogy. Uh, but I think as we look around the world, you judge by actions and not just words. And we've seen, you know, all across Europe, we've got countries that are cranking up their gas and their coal-fired power uh, because they were dependent upon Russian gas. Uh, but that, of course, when reality meets fantasy, 
Uh, reality always wins, and you have to have ed energy sovereignty. And you've got to have 24/7 base load power that runs 365 days a year, rain, hail, or shine. You can't get that from wind. You can't get that from solar. You can only get it from coal or gas uh, or nuclear, and in some cases, a hydro. So, look, I think we are at a turning point uh, into net zero and the broader uh, global warming policies uh, that underpin that. Hey, Garth Hamilton, uh, Donald Trump is uh, taking America out of the Paris Agreement to cut our emissions. Um, that means the top three emitters, that's China, the US and India, and they pump out more than half the world's emissions just between the three of them. They won't be bound by that agreement anymore to cut their emissions. Indonesia isn't either. But we are. Now, does that make sense? Who are we trying to impress? Should we also pull out of the Paris Agreement? Well, firstly, who are we try to impress? I'm not sure we're impressing the average Australian who's going through a cost of living crisis, I can assure you, Andrew. That's the number one issue that people are raising with me. Look, I think we should be looking very closely and watching very closely at what our most uh, closest and most trusted ally, the United States, uh, is going to do in the short future. When we made that commitment, Andrew, a lot has changed since. I want to raise with you four very important things that have changed that underwrote our commitment at the time. Firstly, the Great Artesian Basin Project. Uh, through carbon capture, this was going to solve a lot of our problems. That project has fallen away. The Burdekin Pumped Hydro Project, anyone watching the Queensland political scene will have seen that that project's fallen away and was a complete farce uh, when we looked into it. But the green hydrogen uh, you know, fever dream that struck us for a while there, that's moved on as well. Uh, people are walking away from that as quickly as they can. And when we made that commitment, Snowy 2.0 looked like it was actually going to be completed. Uh, we shouldn't be afraid of change. We should always, every government, should be putting the concerns of the Australian people first, and that's how we should judge any policy position. I'll point out, uh, policy positions aren't set in stone. Look at nuclear. We're trying to change that right now. I think we're doing that because we think it's in the best interest of the Australian people. That's what should guide every government's decisions. Well, you're right to point out that a lot of the alternative green uh, energy schemes the government has been backing have fallen over or gone way over budget. It wouldn't a lesson about being blind to the economies of, of green solutions. Look at the German government. It's just collapsed, heading to a snap election in February. It's collapsed after Germany's finance minister was sacked last week after declaring Germany's economy was in such a mess that it had to dump its own emissions targets. Green policies were killing jobs like they're doing here. Uh, Daniel, what does all this tell you? Well, Andrew, Germany is not a boutique Nordic nation, you know, that the, the climate zealots like to point to. It's a serious industrial manufacturing powerhouse uh, and, uh, you know, sophisticated advanced manufacturing. And, you know, they're, they're seeing the writing on the wall here. Uh, they're seeing the economic reality, which is they cannot maintain uh, their economic base. They cannot maintain their leverage throughout Europe and the broader world uh, under these green energy policies. I mentioned before the geopolitical component that Germany has had to face, which is its dependency on Russian gas. And that's a lesson to us, not to be dependent upon uh, the infrastructure coming in from China for solar panels and wind turbines, because we could face uh, a very si uh, very similar issue in the not too distant future. So as I said before, Andrew, net zero is dead. When we look around the world and the policy actions being taken by governments, uh, it shows that they no longer believe in what they were saying only three or four years ago, as Garth, exactly as Garth was pointing out, so much has changed in the world. And I really do think that Donald Trump's decision to remove America from the Paris Climate Agreement is going to be a catalyst for more global leaders to come out and say, hey, enough is enough. We've got to put our citizens ahead uh, of this global uh, climate zealotry that's running our economies and our societies into the ground.